welcome all of you. And I appreciate you taking a, a few minutes here to review these concepts of GIS with me. I'm in Redlands, California, talking to you live. I mean, it's a little bit scary as uh, these virtual meetings go. Uh, but I, I, I appreciate the opportunity because this is an important time in the history of in the history of your organization, the history of uh, this country, and the history of the world. And I, I strongly believe what I'm going to talk about is going to play a major role in creating and enabling a future a future that's a better future. So the purpose of my slides is really to help you fundamentally to help you succeed in your work. So I intend to tell you a bit about technology trends in my field, geography and geospatial, talk about some of the key applications that you can learn from, help you understand some of the concepts and also implementation patterns. But fundamentally, it's about helping you succeed by uh, sharing and uh, helping you understand. And, and I hope to inspire you on, on some fronts about how you can participate in creating a better future. You are a special group. I mean, strong IT backgrounds, and many of you actually have strong GIS backgrounds. And these, these two fields are sort of synonymous in a way, but they're also distinct. And I'll try to pull those out and uh, highlight them because it's a matter of being able to understand and, and, uh, and, and apply them in effective ways. I'd also like to mention that you have lots of di different backgrounds, and I really wish we were in... In, in a room together so that you can get to know each other. Because as I look through your resumes, you have very different backgrounds that brought you into this space. And you have different organizations. And some of you are even international outside of the US government agencies. It is a government community. It's a public sector community. And much of what I'm going to talk about focuses on that vision of making government better in some ways, transforming how our government runs operationally and also strategically. I'll start by just saying a couple words about ESRI. Some of you know us quite well, but we are an independent software company. One of those that's tier two, we're a few billion dollars in revenue globally. And our main focus is to advance GIS and the science, we call it the science of where. It's actually the science of geography and the tools of GIS brought together. We like that phrase of advancing the science of where because it underpins so much of what all of us do in not just in IT, but do in our uh, lives. We're strong, we're growing, and we are committed to serving our users. This is an unusual tech company because basically all of our revenue goes back into advancing our methods. And this is this has been going on now for 50 years or a little over 50 years. Our customers are all over the world. We have about 350,000 organizations who use our tools. And here's a kind of cross section of the kinds of organizations, many in national, many in state and local, and also many in the Fortune 5000 uh, all across the world actually. Uh, utilities are big users, but also we make our software available to NGOs around the globe and also support heavily the advancement of education, growing the next generation in colleges and universities. The applications provide us some sense of why this technology has such great value. But let me just say it is a generic technology that cuts across virtually all human activities and all kinds of organizations. And these, these examples show you the evidence of the huge impact that it's making. In the environmental modeling and assessment world, our users are applying GIS to everything from climate change down to water quality measurement and, and understanding the patterns and relationships of our natural environment. Now, increasingly facing huge risk due to climate change and other, and other and other activities by humans. In the world of natural resource management, most large timber organizations and agencies are managing their forests using GIS as a foundation. And in agriculture, finding areas that are best to grow certain crops and also understanding the productivity, for example, in precision agriculture, GIS is essential. And then there's in the world of exploration like petroleum, 
finding the right place to drill. And this also is interesting for water, water drilling, using AI and machine learning, lots of great tools here, and likewise in mining. In the public sector, GIS is used extensively for managing land information. Land information is the parcels, the parcels that uh, of ownership, and it's not just about mapping, it's also about all the attributes of property that are being used. These visualizations show dramatically in some cases how we can see and understand patterns about land, land use, uh, the ways to assess it, to do taxation uh, in interesting ways. Creating the future is exciting. I mean, and digital will play a major part of it. Community planning, city planning, regional planning, environmental planning, these are a few examples that are scattered again around the world. Whether it's new town planning or just managing the administrative records that it takes to be able to do uh, administrative planning in cities, these are some examples of our users that are displayed here. Our cities, our regions, our countries are safer because GIS is used for analysis in tens of thousands of law enforcement organizations, but also across the world in being able to figure out where to best locate things like fire stations or be able to respond to EMS uh, emergencies in various ways. Uh, GIS is used extensively in, in, in events like the Super Bowl, for example, where they're setting up security zones and managing populations. But one of my favorite on this one is in the lower left, which shows in Philadelphia, analytic modeling to figure out those areas where there's high priority for investment requirements in public safety. Transportation, the infrastructure that connects us together, uh, is using GIS extensively. And I know some of you in the audience here are CIOs for state agencies, DOTs, uh, county agencies, cities. And here, GIS is just amazing because it shows not only real-time operations like the beautiful map here of, in the state of Maryland uh, for highways showing everybody in real time what's going on, but also being able to do things like predict where accidents might happen based on various characteristics of roads. And it's not just highways, it's also in railroads and, and transit and uh, finding optimum solutions in both the public sector and the private sector. Just a, a real treasure of applications here. GIS is used extensively in responding to disasters, and it seems like we are experiencing increasing volumes of these, everything from hurricanes to floods to fires, wildfires, earthquakes. Well, earthquakes are probably steady, but the rest of them uh, are, are really uh, important to notice that, that, that things are changing rapidly, and GIS or GIS professionals and your agencies are able to respond to them both in short term but also in some cases, long-term things like sea level rise. 2020 was an amazing year for statistical agencies around the world because it's when they do their census, like here in the United States. And GIS was foundational for running the census this year, everything from collecting in the field to this aggregation of data, which will ultimately lead to a reapportionment and uh, redistricting activities. But statistically, GIS is used extensively likewise in health, public health, um, in elections, in tracking homeless. Uh, these are just really exciting applications because they show the value. Now look, in 2020, we have on our hands still this huge tragedy of, of COVID. And here again, thousands and thousands of organizations were able to stand up GIS dashboards to let their executives and their citizens know what's going on. The most uh, popular of which has been the Johns Hopkins dashboard that showed the whole world uh, a new insight into what was going on using maps. But it's not just dashboards and maps, it's also analytics. In the upper left, you can see in the city of Tacoma, they sort of use GIS to model their, their curve, showing where the where the outbreaks are gonna occur uh, more extensively in different neighborhoods. And then they overlaid those forecasts on top of their facilities to understand in those hospitals uh, that would be most impacted, and then they were able to respond. So GIS is more than visualization, it's also analytics, 
and uh, being able to support decision making and, and common understanding by population, a kind of transparency notion. And speaking about transparency, GIS has been extensively used to sort of open up government at multiple fronts with not only open data, but also open services to let citizens not only see the news of what's going on, but increasingly get engaged through portal technology. They can participate in urban planning or they can participate in various initiatives. I'll come back to this more in a couple of minutes, but it is uh, exciting to watch it, how bringing together different sorts of geographic information and connecting to citizens uh, can empower the whole community working in a more collaborative way. The vision of what I wanted to talk about is about geospatial infrastructure. And this, this concept, this technology is, I'll make the assertion, is transforming organizations and looking to the future these next five years and 10 years. I mean, our cities are gonna be different. I mean, we're seeing it, of course, through the huge transformation that has occurred recently because of work from home. I mean, it's downtown London where, you know, like a million people go to work typically every day is dead. Nobody's there. Nobody's actually living there. It's just changing the pattern of how we work. Uh, less office workers in the future this is gonna change the fabric of cities. It's gonna change how people, how transportation happens. It's gonna change how uh, e-commerce is changing, how uh, retail will behave. Lots of things, and by the way, digital and particularly geospatial digital is enabling so many of these changes and will continue to enable changes into the future. We need to make our cities more, more responsive. Uh, and we need it to be more responsive to the environment and, and many different kinds of issues. But I'll start with this concept. You and I live in a complex and interconnected world. And we saw this with COVID, what happened in Wuhan, we could begin to see spreading across the entire globe. It's interconnected. And geography, my favorite science, is a kind of framework for organizing human information, human activities, and also natural information. In that sense, it's an integrative uh, technology or science that helps us understand things. And our geography, our world actually, is, is constantly changing. And it has been changing for, uh, well, millions of years. But today, we are challenged. We're increasingly challenged by what's occurring. And it's introducing uncertainty in many fields. And this uncertainty is kind of all interconnected. This, this is one of those things that keeps us awake. I suppose it certainly does me at night. Everything from overpopulation and climate change to loss of biodiversity. I mean, we are facing the COVID wave of impact, but people are beginning to realize that it's only one thing about uh, that, that's occurring, a kind of crisis that, and there'll be others. And they're actually all interrelated. The message that I guess I want to get across to you is that overcoming these challenges is going to take all of our collective work. And that's why this particular meeting, that's why, why I appreciate you coming to this meeting, it's going to require your specific involvement and uh, leveraging all of your talents. It's going to help us, it's going to require that we understand things better and, and, it's, and collaborate better and communicate effectively to address these challenges. What can we do, actually? I, I think about this almost all the time. And each of us are going to be doing our own thing as individuals. Our organizations are going to be doing things. But uh, leveraging the power of GIS, it occurs to me, uh, especially watching our users work, is going to be one of the big things that, that uh, we do. This is about leveraging our best science and technology. And, addressing things like uh, decarbonizing cities or decarbonizing our organizations or even decarbonizing our personal lives. Being able to improve efficiency will be a big thing. Make cities, now they say smarter, uh, okay, that's wiring everything up so that we can be more responsive. It requires integrative thinking, not just single department any longer. It means bringing information together so that decision makers and 
thinkers, policy people can really understand. And understanding is a big deal. The GIS conceptually is represented by this diagram. And I want you to study the diagram. GIS is a framework and a process. Geography is the sort of science behind it, but it's all about measuring things. Many of you know about that and visualizing through mapping. And that's as far as it goes for some organizations. All they want to do is measure and see it. But behind GIS is a powerful set of analytic tools and modeling tools that allow us to model processes. And then on the basis of that, do interactive design and support alternative scenario building. And then on the basis of that, make decisions and take them to action. So one of my good friends, Richard Saul Werman, often says, understanding precedes action i love that phrase and G gis in many ways is about understanding things providing a visual framework for understanding things and then uh, acting well that's intriguing because it starts with a kind of data model a complete data model that uh, is that, that brings it all together and here, GIS provides many, 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 as you will see, ways to create such a model. Increasingly, this is a real-time model where we're bringing in IoT. Increasingly, it's a 3D model and 4D model. Increasingly, it's transaction updated, just like other IT systems, like accounting systems. We, we add a building, we delete a building, we add a tree, we delete a tree, we add a road, we delete a road. We pave a road, we uh, you know, make a uh, arrest because some bad activity is going. These are all transactions that are in the living city. And in many ways, GIS is a, is a complete living digital twin. And it integrates content and workflows from across organizations, whether it be a city. And for me, I love cities because they're a, a representation of the entire world but increasingly GIS is, is doing this. And organizations, my customers, users, you, many of you, actually many of you, are applying GIS to increasingly uh, larger domains. And these are independent systems. Sometimes they're just individual projects. They're creating little digital twins of an organization and being responsive. And that's delivering great value. But I want you to understand that these the power of web services and the power of the web itself is beginning to interconnect these. And this is leading us to creating a new kind of infrastructure. You know, cities have infrastructure of all types. They have road infrastructure and water infrastructure. They have, um, you know, social infrastructure. Uh, and now they're building as a fundamental part of cities, digital infrastructure. And this digital infrastructure is becoming part of the city and you many of you are in charge of that and how does that all come together so that it is impactful and also one department working with another department uh, bringing the information together so that we see the whole so we can approach problem solving more holistically this is this is exciting to me well the story of this slide is that these separate infrastructures, these separate, sorry, uh, digital twins are becoming interconnected using geography and web services. Okay, how is that happening? It's happening because location is a kind of common key to interconnect distributed geospatial services. I can bring in data from the Census Bureau. Uh, I can bring in data from EPA at the national level and layer it on top of my local data in a state or in a city and bring them together. So geospatial infrastructure is a kind of modern GIS. It's not just GIS for a particular organization or a particular department, although those are definitely uh, components of it. It's infrastructure where the, through portals we can interconnect these open data services and have a system of systems leveraging the services-based architecture and these portals, which allow us to discover and interconnect geographic data from different organizations. 
Now this is supporting individuals. I mean, as an individual, I can get into the infrastructure and have a look. I can look at teaming with others. I can uh, support departments and organizations and whole communities. So this is exciting to me because it's a new stage. It isn't GIS for projects or GIS for departments or GIS for even an enterprise. It's GIS that interconnects the science of our world so that we can see and approach problem solving more holistically. So this is this is sort of the heart of the theme of this particular meeting. Now this geospatial infrastructure is not just running all by itself. It's interconnecting and integrating and leveraging many technologies. I'll just simply say shared services as a concept is one of them, but also big data, geoai machine learning it's increasingly in the cloud and it opens up with mapping and apps that make it available and transparent for everybody to get involved just like the coronavirus um, maps sort of pave the way for people to sort of see the future and this is going to continue to expand this idea of geography being a common key to integrate lots of different things First off, it integrates lots of different data. So many people think of GIS as a unique kind of data. Well, it does have unique kind of data like map vectors, but it also brings in tabular data, relational databases, and also increasingly unstructured data, being able to spatialize it and see it. It brings in imagery and voxels and multi-dimension data and real-time data that can connect now to real-time IoT and see things moving around on a map. This is no longer your old man's GIS, you know. It's, it's continuously, dynamically being able to bring information together. And apps are delivering just amazing capabilities because apps can be built, open services-based apps in web or in, in devices. They can access this infrastructure of, uh, you know, millions of map layers that are increasingly available on the web. And that means I can reach citizens, I can reach uh, field workers, I can reach specialists in various domains using visualization and analysis. Maps and dashboards are becoming pervasive. You know that little corona map up there in the upper right hand corner from Johns Hopkins now has been looked at almost two trillion times. This is, <laughs> every day we make billions and billions of maps off of that site and that site references distributed information. It brings together data from around the web, from around the world, and gives the daily report. And increasingly, it's real time. And that's been replicated in cities after countries, after agencies around the world. It's helping us tell stories, and it's helping the world understand these stories by having geographic context, and it's increasingly real time. Speaking about analytics, this isn't just a uh, a mapping system. The idea is that we can do real-time big data analytics and see things uh, into the future that we were not able to uh, understand before. And GIS is not a closed system. It integrates in all the new open science tools um, using things like uh, notebooks uh, that can interconnect uh, the world's work. It's just a way to access and leverage that work in effective ways. Another area is that excites me is that GIS is becoming increasingly embedded. Uh, last week, ESRI announced a new initiative to provide GIS as a platform. This really means pass services for millions of developers. But already we have connected to some of the big IT organizations, people like SAP, or Salesforce, or Microsoft, or Autodesk, or Adobe, where our technology is embedded in their technology so that you can be in something like Power BI and do standard analytics. But wow, you can also empower yourself with these map services from your own organization or other organizations around the world. And similarly in Salesforce and, and so on. I'm excited because GIS is also opening up for increasing engagements. There's a technology you'll learn about called Hub, and this is opening up GIS for citizen access in a community. 
with maps, stories, apps that a community can engage their people and bring the community together. Get everybody working in the community on the common goals of the community with initiatives. And uh, again, you'll see this increasingly play out. Initially, we developed this in the city of Los Angeles, and Los Angeles is still using it extensively to connect their communities. But also, we're beginning to see how engagement happens between one agency and another agency, like the Census Bureau and state and local agencies, or on corona between FEMA and uh, uh, CDC and, and other emergency responders. It's, it's an amazing time to be in GIS, and I, I've been around for a long time watching. This is sort of like a big evolutionary step where organizations are increasingly collaborating. They're making their open services available and building whole new partnerships. So to make that real, let me just talk about up in the upper left-hand corner, Pacific Gas and Electric, one of America's biggest utilities, has now opened up uh, their emergency information on outage and, and where fires are and their utilities to the state agency, the, the Public Utility Commission here in California. And they're sharing information through web services back and forth. And as a result, there's more holistic activities going on. And that's been copied now up and down the coast here in California uh, among various utilities and various state agencies. Also, local governments are beginning to plan together in uh, associations, hundreds of them. The census I already mentioned. Shared services up in, in Canada are really taking off. This example I show with York in Canada, uh, they've just got all kinds of cities and counties regionally cooperating to build. Uh, in other words, they don't have to do everything themselves. I can bring in the weather. I can bring in uh, somebody else's good work in real time and unify it. That's what I'm talking about in terms of the geospatial infrastructure and solve mutual problems and increasingly be more efficient in this way. So I'll conclude this part of my talk simply saying GIS is becoming a powerful force. This, so I started 50 years ago doing little projects with GIS and I was fascinated by it because I realized I could overlay all these maps and do a better job in design and planning work using it. Uh, but that grew into being able to deal with missions and whole departments using GIS at the business application level. And then later, as services began to become popular, whole organizations could have common foundations like they have with other IT systems like ERP and CRM. Uh, and now, as you're seeing it, coalitions of different organizations are coming together and addressing so many challenges. The little white stuff on the right here is really uh, sort of what's driving it. People can automate work increasingly automate and uh, even use AI and machine learning to accelerate this automation. And then improve communication. We all know that maps communicate. And then understand some of the complexity that's going on in 2D and 3D and 4D and so on. And my big, my big, my big excitement is I see more holistic solutions coming out of this framework, holistic solutions that address some of these bigger challenges that are facing all of us. And you, as IT and GIS professionals, wow, what an amazing adventure you're going to have in the next few years, bringing this all together in your organizations and, and, uh, and, and, and making a better world. I'd now like to pause for a moment and move into a short description of what ESRI is doing with our work. And our, our big goal is really to build useful technology in the geospatial area to help you do your work better. And that's our big aim. That's our big vision. Uh, and in 2021, we're rolling out a whole new set of, of versions of our technology, and I'll preview some of that. But behind those new versions is a fundamental philosophy of having a common platform that would serve different kinds of communities. One is the traditional GIS community, and that's been, uh, well, 10 million users now around the world uh, marching along but also expanding into the whole mapping and location services that can expand and empower whole organizations. Not with simple mapping, but with really rich analytics behind it. And then a new 
area of work is in the what I guess I call spatial BI, but it's really location analytics, where I can really use in a very simple environment tools to be able to explore and analyze data quickly in a non-GIS environment, but leveraging much of the power of GIS. A couple of years ago, we also began to take our core tools and build what we call geo-enabled systems. And these are specialized systems for particular communities. I'll talk about that in a moment as well. Many of you are interested in, in, in our strategy, and, and I want to explain it very carefully. One is we will continue building strong software tools that can run on your own machines for as long as, as I can imagine. But we also have made a pivot and are increasingly providing our capabilities as SaaS, cloud-based SaaS. And then more recently, we've sort of opened up the hood of our engines and also providing pass tools so that developers can build their own in various environments. And whole enterprises can be empowered by the power of consumption-based geospatial services. As we conceive of ArcGIS, we see it as three kinds of systems, and you will recognize uh, these right away. One of them is a system of record keeping, and that's like a relational database. You know, you're doing transaction data management of geographic stuff. A second one is a system of insights. This is all about analytics, spatial analytics or spatial temporal analytics. And we have literally thousands of tools that run in the same system. They're not separate systems that do that. And the third one is a system of engagement that can reach out and connect to citizens through maps and apps of various times. And all three of those are increasingly becoming real time with field integration and IoT and increasingly remote sensing. Geography is coming alive for our customers and our organizations that support it. The implementation patterns of our technology continue to be in the desktop. And you might sort of say, well, desktop, that's so uh, historic, okay, <laughs> not for me. Actually, our desktop technology is really advanced. It's become not just for the desktop, it's kind of a thick client to enterprise solutions. And we have millions of customers that use it, both for independent personal productivity work and on projects, but also connecting into large enterprise server technology. And that's our second world. We have literally hundreds of thousands of these geospatial servers that do the management of geographic data and then provide access through various apps out to various uh, users around their organizations. Our third pattern is cloud, and this is the SaaS pattern and also the PaaS pattern. And for some customers, we do hosted work. Uh, and this is about taking existing data across an organization, bringing it together dynamically, and then make it available. And in our case, we have about 10 million users who are using our cloud SaaS pattern today. We've just really launched a new fourth pattern, which is being able to access that information from APIs, open, a, open source APIs that provide access for developers of all types. ArcGIS keeps advancing. Uh, somebody asked me the other day, okay, what's gonna be the big disruptive technology this year? And I think, wow, that's a funny question because what we try to do at ESRI is we take new technologies that are emerging in the area of data management and computing and science and increasingly in, integrate them into our next release. And that's been an activity that uh, we've distinguished ourselves on for many decades. This year, some of the big things are uh, imagery in the cloud and drones and AI and machine learning and augmented reality and real time and, and uh, so on. And I'll cover some of these, but I, I want you to uh, pause and realize that GIS is a, a continuously advancing technology in its own right that integrates and works with all of these others. I'll also make the point that ArcGIS is an open platform. It is, of course, proprietary, S3 owns it, but it, we've done a good job of making it accessible uh, with open APIs and interoperable standards-based uh, tools. Uh, and also it's easily customizable. Uh, and finally, I'd simply say it's the evidence of its openness is that we 
have successfully integrated into really thousands and thousands of bigger enterprise systems that are heterogeneous and uh, dynamic. Our cloud strategy is quite simple, actually. Let me uh, back up here. We support software, excuse me, software in the cloud. So we, our software tools, our enterprise tools, run very comfortably in a variety of environments, uh, commercial clouds and, and private clouds. Uh, also, we provide this SaaS software as a service in the form of ArcGIS Online, which complements our other software. Now, PaaS, and occasionally we do support the idea of managing services for our customers. The, th this entire ecosystem of technology keeps advancing, and here are a few of the big themes that we're working on right now. Actually, I'll cover tools that have come out in the last couple of years that reflect advances in field operations or in 3D visualization or more uh, interesting models. And applications of this really uh, provide the evidence that it really works this way. You're gonna see some of that dynamically during the conference uh, today and tomorrow. RTS includes billions of dollars of ready to use content. It lives in the cloud and all of our users, whether they're in the desktop or in the server, have free access to use these layers and we maintain them ourselves. We call it the living atlas, but also our users continually share their data. Right now it's at about 33 million data sets have been shared, uh, some of them not open to all users, but they continue to advance this idea of building a collective database of, of spatial information for people to use. In the tools area, we have, I'll just hit a couple of highlights. We have new tools for smart mapping. This is really taking some of the principles of machine learning to incorporate some of the big concepts of great cartography and, uh, and, and automation uh, so that mere mortals can actually make beautiful maps. Uh, and this is, these are embedded in map viewers and, and desktops. Here are just a few of the new uh, items that we've added in the last year. In the spatial analysis world, as I mentioned, there are thousands of interesting tools that help look at data engineering, at uh, visualization and exploration, uh, spatial tools that interconnect things, do things like route op optimization, but for the more sophisticated user, look at suitability modeling of various types. And then there's the big data, machine learning, AI, modeling, uh, integration with Jupyter Notebooks and so on. This is an active area of uh, AI and machine learning, as you know better than, and than most, across all different domains. And that's been our approach, is to integrate all these new open source and data science ecosystem tools right into GIS. Our attempt here is not to build a AI machine learning tool suite on our own. It's really to take concepts and emerging technologies and make them available to our users in our in our enterprise systems, in our desktops, in our online environments. But there are certain things that are unique to spatial. Uh, spatial machine learning, object extraction off of imagery, and so on. And we're on the frontier of many of those kinds of activities. I'll simply say automating and integrating these spatial analytics into our core platform and making them available right across your organizations is now entirely possible. I love 3D visualization, looking at things like fly-throughs and so on. This is, this is fun for me, being able to extrude information out of your tabular databases and see them in various forms is very exciting. Well, we, 3D visualization for us is a wide spectrum, again, of emerging technologies, and these are just a few of them, including on the frontier, things like AI, A AR and and uh, virtual reality, and also gaming engines. This year, 2021, we're integrating the leading gaming engines as clients into our ecosystem for the kind of visualization and simulation work that uh, some of you are interested in. Now, I don't suspect that, uh, that, that everybody's interested in all of these various things, but uh, increasingly, <laughs> they are becoming popular. This one is another portfolio of work we're doing in real time visualization and analytics. This dates back about 10 years ago when we built something called the GeoEvent server that took real-time IoT data and plugged it right in as a data source for our GIS. 
but more recently we released something called Velocity. This is a cloud-based pass cloud environment where you can take IoT from any source connected to our cloud and do real-time geoprocessing or in-stream geoprocessing, things like getting near or outside of a, of a, of a window or something, uh, and then feed it right into your enterprise applications. And many of our customers are tracking their buses, they're tracking their people, they're tracking anything that moves and changes, the stationary data and using this uh, platform. Speaking about people in the field, GIS is rich because it's not just enterprise GIS, it's connecting people in the field with that enterprise information, sort of both in the areas of data capture, doing inspections as transactions onto the database, and also managing field workers, uh, routing field workers from place to place, exploring while you're in the field, geographic information in the enterprise, and also just tracking, where is everybody? And this is becoming increasingly important in the area of uh, you know, emergency management and, and real-time events that are going on. And let me just say, I can't share it all with you, but from the top to the, to the, the biggest agencies to the smallest agencies are finding this very, very practical to uh, digitally enable their mobile workers and locationally track and understand uh, their work and help them do their work more efficiently. <clears throat> I've talked about some of our R&D, some of the concepts of ArcGIS. Now I'd like to finish off by just hitting that there are products. And actually there are a few products. There's, as I mentioned, the desktop product, but that's also integrated in with our enterprise product and our online cloud system. And then there's solutions and then there's apps. So what I guess I want to get across is there's one product actually, but you can license it in various ways for different kinds of applications. And that's very important for people who are conceiving of departmental or full enterprise environments. It's all one system. It's all been designed to work together. It isn't just location out in outer space that I have to integrate together. No, it's by design, one integrated platform that integrates with everything else easily. In addition to these core products, as I mentioned, Esri has developed a series of geo-enabled systems. These are not GISs. They are focused on specialized workflows in the area of urban planning, in the area of business and community analysis, in the area of managing indoor spaces, and also in the areas of awareness and collaboration with a product we call Mission for addressing things like fires or uh, events uh, that that are uh, out of control. You know, we have to have people that really manage them. Uh, and so the, these are not, again, GISs. They're, you might think of them as applications, but they're really not applications. They're really standalone systems that are deployable for things like, uh, well, these subjects. Indoors is one of the fastest growing parts of our business. It really manages indoor spaces just like you would manage outdoor spaces or whole cities. And big property owners from GSA down to airports to large corporations to, uh, yeah, they're saying, I wanna manage all the data that I have about my, my buildings and I wanna support facility operations and, and space management. Uh, right now it's being used extensively for getting people back to work or planning how they're gonna get them back to work into the office. And then it provides also a kind of occupant experience of wayfinding through buildings. Again, on large campuses, uh, this is become, uh, becoming really interesting. A second one is, well, I, I won't go any further into, mission, into these geospatially enabled systems. I'll just simply say indoors is big. Uh, the, the, the last bit of technology that I'll say is, as I mentioned, we have opened up our tools, our base products, our services for developers. And these, these represent some of the uh, JavaScript API tools that are available for developers to build really cool tools in browsers or on mobile devices. And uh, we have about 150,000 developers who use our tools inside of enterprise, but also inside of uh, small startups and some not so small like uh, Facebook, and, um, sorry, like uh, Salesforce and, uh, and others. Uh, very, very exciting to me because it means we're expanding out the power 
of geographic information out to many, 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 many other organizations. What's next for us? And this is something that we review every, I suppose we review it every week, we review it every month, we review it every year, and we lay out a, an agenda for what we wanna work on. These are some of the things that we see are important uh, research efforts that we will continue working on into the future. And they are, uh, you know, well, you can look at this list and perhaps better than me explaining, a whole plethora of different innovations and activities that we're putting into this year's um, uh, development strategy. Well, I, I've covered a lot of ground this morning. I hope I was successful in kicking off your uh, meeting here of the CIO conference. I, I'm excited because for me, in my entire career, I've never seen GIS so alive. Our business is one way to indicate it. Our business is growing. Uh, our users are loving it. And GIS and geospatial science, geographic science, are, are all evolving rapidly. And the, one of my assertions in this particular meeting is it's becoming a kind of infrastructure, like an urban infrastructure, like water infrastructure, or road infrastructure, or other kinds of digital infrastructure. And that's going to, that's going to co-evolve with cities and counties and states uh, and national government. Uh, it's, uh, I, I think it's more, well, it's not more powerful than that. <laughs> anyway, I, I think it's a, as, at least it's significant because in these times particularly, this infrastructure will be helping individuals and organizations, all of us address some of these great challenges that we're facing. I mean, the collective work of you and IT and your colleagues in GIS are becoming powerful force and I kind of get to watch it on the front lines you know everything from COVID to emergency response to the great science that's going on and I think this will create not only geographic knowledge everywhere so that we are smarter like a nervous system in our collective activities but it's going to impact so much of the future building this kind of infrastructure requires more than and then Esri's technology, it's, that's a part. And we've been working hard at that so that it's open and interoperable and usable and embeddable and all of those things that, and scalable and so on. But it's much more than that. It also requires leadership. And this is uh, where I really wanna speak to you because it is leadership and strategy and creating the kind of culture of collaboration where you, know, you can share services, you can make new kinds of engagements with your colleagues in other governments or in different departments. This is essential, that kind of uh, feeling. And I also feel like it's very important simply to conclude by saying this kind of collaboration, something that, that all of us need to learn how to do more successfully, happens at the speed of trust. And it's easy to get sort of distorted by listening to all the TV craziness of polarization and this and that and lose insight into what's really important, and that is trust. Uh, and I, I, I believe that this is something you can, we can all work on together. So ladies and gentlemen, I've covered a lot of ground in terms of the concepts of GIS, some of the applications, um, some of the things that ESRI is working on, and we're working hard at it, uh, some of the ways that we can support you. And uh, I really wanna say thank you for taking the time to attend this morning and uh, and being who you are, I, I really do appreciate it.